Back in 1998, this Macintosh MC4000M cost $4,000. Two VU meters, six channels of awesomeness. Let's find out what it's all about. Big D, roll that beautiful beam footage. When some people hear the name Macintosh, they think Apple Computer, 1984, Steve Jobs. But did you realize they had to pay Macintosh Laboratory of Binghamton, New York for the usage of the name Macintosh because they are the OGs. That's right. We're stepping way back to 1949 when Macintosh Laboratory introduced their first amplifier, a 50-watt monoblock. Now it's 75 years later. That's right. They're celebrating their 75th anniversary with a very cool amplifier called the MC 2.1 KW one channel solid state amplifier, 2000 Watts comes in three separate components at the low, low price of $50,000. That's right. I'll leave links below. If you'd like to go check one out, your local dealer. As for the car audio scene, if you've been paying attention to the Jeep Grand Wagoneer, Yes, they have a Macintosh head unit with the dual VU meters installed on it as well. But my friends, we're going to step back to August 27th, 1990, when Clarion takes over Macintosh Laboratory, and the president, Mr. Yakuta Ayamada, gave a speech to the Macintosh employees. We at Clarion are very excited to work with you to build upon Macintosh's tradition of excellence. An important part of our future is Macintosh and you. I would like to emphasize that we merged with Macintosh because we like Macintosh as it is, and we have no intention of changing what has made it so successful. So although Clarion purchased Macintosh Laboratory in 1990, according to their timeline, it was 1994 when they introduced their first car audio product. In the book Macintosh for the Love of Music by Ken Kessler, there's an article which mentions two engineers, Pete Urban and Charlie Randall saying they designed and developed the Macintosh MC4000M. In Car Audio and Electronics, the May 1995 issue, in the Hot News section where they show off the new products, we saw the Macintosh MC4000M, six-channel amplifier with built-in crossover, two-ohm stability, suggests a retail price $2,500. We'll come back to that. We also have a Japanese brochure of Macintosh Car Audio from way back around 1998. And Macintosh was very popular in Japan due to their audio file grade components. And believe it or not, made in the USA was important to Japanese back in the day as much as it was to us. Here you can see again the MC4000M as well as several other models of amplifiers that were available over the years. Again, we're going to focus on mainly the six channel amp for this video. I've also tested the MC443. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. You can check that out previous amp. Back to the big dog, Car Stereo Review, March, April, 1995. Ken C. Pullman of Hammer Laboratories says, the MC4000M proved to be a test bench champ setting several all time record measurements. Frequency response was essentially flat, signal to noise ratio, THD plus noise and channel separation were excellent. We'll come back to Ken's results and compare them to mine after we do our amp dyno test. Now, 1995 Car Stereo Review has the Macintosh amplifiers, and of course, the MC4000M shows up for $2,500. That is $5,120 in 2024, adjusted for inflation. Now, 1997, the amplifiers list price goes up to $3,000, but wait for it. 1998, it's bumped up again to $4,000. That's equivalent to $7,660 in 2024. Whoa. As for specs, it's a six channel amp, four times 100 plus two times 300. Has a built in crossover, dual illuminated level meters, tunnel forced air cooling. And guess what? Your boy Dan Bailey hooked me up and found one in Atlanta. That's right. And we got it and sent it this way. This was in August 2020, right during the pandemic. So since then, I've had the amplifier sent off to Sean King, my favorite technician. He recapped the amplifier over 100 capacitors and did some servicing to the amp as well. So it should be good to go. So of course, I wrap it up like I do all my amps just to protect them, make sure they're completely safe. So let's get it unwrapped, clean it off, and take a closer look at this beast. 
Now, price is a beast, and the amp itself is a beast. 34 inches in length, 12 inches in width, and almost 3 inches in height. This is a beefy chunk of aluminum and a slab of glass, too. On the left side here, you'll see power output meters for channels 1 through 4, power guard meter there as well. On the right, we have channels 5 through 6, again with a power guard LED. We'll show all that later in the video. Just this amp showing it in a video just really doesn't do it justice. It is so beautiful in person, but it's my job to show you guys through the video how cool this amp is. So let's move to the end panel and see what it's all about. Here you can see on one end, we have six RCA inputs, the outputs for all six speakers, also the turn on as well as the power guard connection. Now Big Dummy in a previous video with a Macintosh amp disabled the power guard. And if you guys don't remember, here's what happened. What up? You big dummy! Disabling power guard for the lose. We will do our best not to blow up this massive Macintosh MC4000M. Now you notice the amp has fans here on the end. It's active cooling. It has a push-pull design. And you see the top there, there's a big piece of glass. We'll show that here shortly. On the opposite side, we have four gauge for power and ground. Also, we have four different buttons. These are circuit breakers, which are easily resettable by pushing the buttons here. And again, we have active cooling with the fans and push-pull operation. You can see a little bit of pitting here on the gold-plated four gauge terminals for power input, but no issues there. Now, let's take off one of these end panels, which is aluminum with two screws. And you might be wondering, well, what if my Macintosh amp doesn't have these? Well, you can check eBay. There's a guy selling them $300 for two of them and four screws. Now he must not have got the memo, I'm guessing. This is not a Mickey Mouse program. Once we remove that $150 piece of aluminum, you'll notice the RCAs, which are not Tiffany style, what's going on Macintosh. But you'll also see we have Eight screws here on the top of the amp, which hold down this extremely rare and impossible to find piece of glass, which we'll take off two more screws here in this other little piece, and then we'll slide very carefully this panel of glass out so we can see what's inside the amplifier. If you have one of these amplifiers and send it off to a technician, make sure you remove this piece of glass first, because again, these things are unobtainium. You will not be able to find another piece of glass like that. Now, unfortunately, you do need to take out the piece of glass to get to some of the controls of the amplifier. So of course, it's a great idea to go ahead and set your amplifier up before <laughs> you mount it in the car. Here you can see there's an environmental equalizer with 150 hertz controls and 45 hertz controls. There were additional modules available as well from Macintosh at the time, the MEQ 451, 452, and 453, but these also required the MEC 459, which was a LCD display that controlled these parametric EQs. Also under the glass were the settings for crossovers, subwoofer and high pass filter for the four channels, as well as the four, five, or six channel switch, and then level controls individual for each of the six channels. That's right, full control over each of the individual channels. That's nice. Now the opposite end of the amp also has this $150 piece of aluminum, which prevents you from tightening down your power and ground connection. So we do have to remove this before we can get the amplifier connected up. Now we told you about the amp, the specifications, the length, the dimensions, all that good stuff. Let's talk about how much power it puts out. First off, we're gonna try the four channel mode. We're gonna switch it to the six channel mode on the amp and connect all the channels up, that's right, the ones we're not testing will also be hooked up to resistors. And we're gonna have to hook up six channels of RCAs because these are all needed in order to do the six channel test. Again, the amp's rated 100 watts by four. We're doing the four channel section first, so that's what we're gonna be focusing on. But again, the sub channels are gonna be loaded down at four ohms as well. Let's try four ohms, four channels. We're gonna tease you a little bit by showing these beautiful VU meters. First up, we're gonna try the certified test, which stops at 1% distortion, rated 100 watts by four, and there you can see 132 right at 14 volts. So you're well above the rated power, but again, the rated power on this amplifier is 0.005% THD. 
So uh, just go with that too. Dynamically, it's about the same, right about 130 watts at 14.4 volts. Next up, we're gonna switch the amp to the four channel mode so that we can bridge the front channels down to two. So we're gonna take it down from 100 by four down to two channels. And here's how it's done on the amplifier. You see how it's wired. It's nicely silk screen on the amp so you don't have to have the manual to see that. But in this case, you only need RCAs for channels one and three. That does channels one through four. And then you need five and six that covers the two sub channels. Amplifier is not rated at eight ohms in the four channel bridge mode, but we're gonna try it out here and see what we get. Certified test again, trying to stay close to 14.4. We get 166 watts times two. That's bridged again. So the interesting thing to note here is when we did these tests, you don't see the distortion light come and stay on. It's because power guard on the amplifier doesn't allow it to get even to 1% distortion. So it stays very clean throughout all these tests. Dynamically at eight ohms, right about the same. We're not seeing a big difference in power output here with dynamic tests, but a right around 164 watts average per channel at 14.4. Now we're gonna try the amplifier's four channel section bridged at four ohms. There are no ratings provided. Let's find out what we get. Here we go, certified test first again. Amp never hits 1% distortion, but right around 290 watts per channel. It says 290 by two plus the 300 by two on the other two channels. Dynamically, right around 300 watts, about maybe 295 average at 14.3. Next up, we're gonna move to the sub channel, which is rated 300 watts by two at four ohms. We don't have any ratings at eight ohms. We're gonna try it there first again. All the channels are loaded down with resistors. And here's channels five and six on the amplifier. Very simple, very easy to connect up, up to 12 gauge speaker wire. Here you can see we have all the inserts with wire ferrules. Thanks to everybody who's begged me to use those in the past. I am using them now. So let's go ahead and try it certified at eight ohms, 300 by two at four ohms. So what does it do at eight ohms? Right at 200 watts, 194, 193 at 14.22. Dynamically, let's send the one kilohertz burst track into the amp. And once again, it's right about the same. The power guard circuit in this amp really does its job in limiting the distortion of the output. Now let's try four ohms. This is where it's rated 300 watts by two. Again, all the channels are loaded down. So that really puts stress on the amplifier. Let's see what we get here certified. And check it out, 368 watts by two at 14.26. And that's well under 1% distortion, thanks to power guard. Now dynamically, right about the same again, 366 right at 14.4 volts. Here are all the results of the test I just showed you, four channel sections up first, 132 by four at four channels versus 100 by four rated did well. And as far as the sub-channel rated 300 by two, we got 368 by two. And again, amplifier never hit 1% distortion. So power guard was doing its trick. Now, if we go back to Ken C. Pullman's test, he got 130 by four at four ohms, 376 by two at four ohms on the sub-channel. So we're nearly identical in our results. Now it's impossible to portray sound quality over YouTube video but in this case, I'm gonna show you guys some little flexing of the subwoofer and try to give you an idea of how this amplifier sounded. But you really need to hear one of these in person. And this thing sounds awesome. Let's crank it up.
Now it was a little tongue-in-cheek to play Basitronics using a Macintosh amp, but we still bumped it. Here you can see the power guard becoming enabled with the output of channels five and six, but I did not hear anything in the speakers to denote any type of distortion. And we got the flare out to check the temperature of the amp. It didn't get much more than mid nineties on the outside of the amplifier. So it stayed nice and cool after hour or more of pumping music. As for the internals, the MC 4000 M is a beast to get inside of. So I'm going to go with the pictures that Sean King provided me sent the amplifier to him to be recapped and completely reserviced. And you can see here, definitely need to be recapped. <laughs> no doubt that a lot of the caps were leaking and could cause damage to the board if left undone. So make sure you get these replaced. Even though they're Nichicons, which are high quality capacitors, they still need to be replaced in an amplifier like this with over a hundred capacitors. Yes, it is an expensive endeavor, but you buy a Ferrari, you get used to Ferrari maintenance. This amplifier incorporates four MOSFET power supplies in addition to 77 bipolar output devices run along the outer edge of the board. You can see them clamped on here. Also, this amplifier has negative feedback and is tightly regulated. Top quality parts are used throughout. Thanks again to Sean and Jason Gibson here for providing these internal picks of this amplifier so we can all drool over its awesomeness. Now, over the years, this is one of the amplifiers that's always eluded me. It's way too expensive, could never afford it. But I came across this one a pretty decent deal. Knew that Sean could fix it up and said, hey, I'm going to grab this thing. We're going to talk about the history. We're going to show it on YouTube. We're going to play some music, watch the VU meters jump back and forth. It's a lot of fun. I was not disappointed. This amplifier sounded amazing. I know it's probably got a lot to do with me just thinking it should sound good. And psychoacoustics is a thing. I also want to give Corey a shout out. He's the guy I bought this from. He was actually willing to send it to me and let me try it out before I paid him. Now that's some dedication right there. He loves my videos. I appreciate you, man. Thanks as always for my supporters, patreon.com slash oldschoolstereo. Let me know in the video description below what your dream app is. Big D, I'm out.